Hey there, all you 40K fanatics. Welcome back to the podcast. It's me, Casey, here, your lore master. And Shane, and you are more energetic suddenly than you were a moment before we turned the mic on. Well, what you got to fake it to make it, you know. You faking it? Yeah, I'm totally faking it. You, went on, on, you went on vacation. Do you need a vacation? I went all the way to Chicago and Indianapolis and back to Northeast Arkansas in one weekend. And that I'm was exhausted. not on a plane. Oh, no, that is all driving. My back is killing me from sitting in that car. And on top of that, I've been painting a whole Dark Angels army. But straight to the bits box. You're, uh, you're painting yeah. that like on commission? Are you, are you getting paid money? No, money? no, I'm doing that for as a favor for a friend. He's a really good friend. He deserves it. I got him some models. You know uh, what they say about giving it, what, giving it away for free? Uh, I don't know. It helps me get experience, you know? More more models painted is more experience for me. Casey giving up the paint and booty. But on a more positive note, I have finished Lion, Son of the Forest. Oh, yeah? Which just came out a few weeks ago, and it is a... This is a book, book, book. Oh, it is sweet. It's all about Lionel Johnson, the Primarch of the Dark Angels, in the current 40K setting and coming back and doing stuff. And man, does he do stuff. It now, is awesome. Now, timeline's real messed up. The warp has corrupted our podcast to the max. The 10th edition warp. Because in the main topic today, we're going to talk quite a bit, a bit, quite a bit about the book because uh, Casey's not looked at anything. And I have I'm no idea. Data sheets. Yeah, well, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. The Xenos come out tomorrow. As, tomorrow as of recording to this. So you haven't even seen your Orky boys. So we're just going to kind of bounce around today. And I've lost my train of thought for what I was actually going to say. I've looked at the Chaos Space Marines, uh, oh, yeah. just the I general ones. Them. I've looked a little bit into the Thousand Suns. I didn't want to look into Death Guard because I've heard bad things about Death Guard. But, you know, I'm going to withhold judgment until those points come out. So uh, I'm, I've, I've got I've got a thing for the people on the points. I, I do appreciate that uh, what I've heard about some models going Legends, though, the key word for Legends isn't on any of these data cards. Yeah, I haven't seen anything that denotes anything as Legends either. Like, are they going to give us a big Legends sheet? Because they had an article. I don't know. Um, you know, I wouldn't put it past them if oh, they I said that what these I was, things were going to be Legends. I remember what tangent I was running on for What a is moment. the tangent? Tell us the tangent. Has our Lionel Johnson pod come out? It has not. It has not. So we've recorded... Back in the before time, a Lionel Johnson pod. Yes. And it's really good and most informative. Very and informative. I will need to listen to it when it comes out because I don't remember anything. But <laughs> let's cover the book right now. Tell me about this book. Where does it start? I guess he's on Caliban at this point? No. Uh, well, in a way. Um, so in the current 40K setting, a lot has changed. We're in the era Indomitus. Primark Rebute Gilliman is doing some stuff. The universe is split in half. Blood Angels are in charge of one half. The Rebute Gilliman is in charge of the other half. Now Leviathan showing up to give Gilliman a run for his money. And now, well, the Primarch of the Dark Angels, Lionel Johnson, has returned. He sort of wakes up and he's got this new mystical warp power. He doesn't fully understand. He doesn't have any memory. And apparently he's just been sleeping for the last 10,000 years. So his body has actually aged. And he's like, man, what's wrong with me? I've lost a step. One of my traitor brothers would kill me in two seconds. And then throughout the book, he starts reuniting with um, his fallen sons. The fallen, known to the Dark Angels um, or the Unforgiven. The fallen were the Dark Angels that turned traitor on Caliban, led by his mentor and best friend, Luther. And now he is going through and he is finding all these fallen angels and trying to reclaim planets that have been attacked by a chaos faction. So do we get a whole bunch of uh, interaction with him and Luther in the book? Actually, Luther is not in it. Oh, um, no, he's not. I wanted to bring that up. It's not really involved in the book, but it is involved in the lore. So um, maybe we could talk about that another day. I don't know what you want to do with that. I don't know what I want to do with anything today. Oh, that's true. It's, we're, it, we're talking I, I about 10th. Te- this thing, kind of throwed us off. We are in the 10th edition minds, along with every other content creator that there is. We're drowning in 10th content. There's a Kill Team pod that you guys haven't heard. Yeah, we have the the the, the Primark for Lionel Johnson pod. We've got the Kill Team pod. And we just keep... Ha- it's like every week, something new. We're just pushing and pushing because these 10th edition minds, they, they giveth and they take it the way. Yeah, I mean, all that stuff that went Legends. Then we've got the data card reveals. Oh, the data card reveals. Then we've got reveals of, like, characters and stuff the week before that. I've got to open my bits box, though. Well, what's... Okay, open so, up your bits box. What you got? So, so, so. I am... 
still involved, which if if we had had everything come out as it was supposed to, I've been playing Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom for a month solid, far too many hours than one should admit to. I'll okay. say it's in just about every podcast we have. It's been in every podcast because it's been in every waking moment of my life. It's so good, but I'm going to try to stop talking about it because you guys are going to get three or four other podcasts where I'm going to be talking about Tears of the Kingdom. No more at length than this. But um, I did do a little bit of hobbying, okay? What was so, that hobbying? I, uh, Blood Bowl or was it Kill Team? I got to play Blood Bowl. So the other day, I told you guys about how I had made these New England Patriots-style Elven Union uh, Blood Bowl team. And they look good. And they look good. They are a little bit blue in the skin, a little bit smurfy. However, in the bright lights of Gamers Haven, shout out to our friendly local game store over in Jonesboro, uh, where I played the homie Gabe. Shout out, Gabe. Um, I gave him their first run. and they You taught them? They looked good. I won two to one. Um, they're very squishy. They're squishy. I mean, it's just elves. Well, they're elves, right? Yeah, they're they're all elves, and I don't have any star players, and we're just playing with like a million a million bucks or a million gold or whatever the salary cap is, basically the points number. And so, I don't I don't have anything special. I don't have any heavy hitters. I've just got basically elf Tom Brady, and then two catchers. Elf Gronk, Elf Julian Edelman. Okay. All right? And so I come out. I I receive, I believe I received the ball to start. I ran my end around. Basically, a screen pass. looked just like it does on Madden. And uh, one, two, three turns. Touchdown. Up one. Okay. He got the ball. I popped the ball out. Ran my blitzer. The thing about the Elves is they're, they're not terribly durable. Yeah, they're But squishy. they are quite coordinated and they and are fast. quite fast. Yeah. Some of the guys are fast. The linemen kind of don't do anything. But, uh, yeah, so my catchers move eight spaces, whereas he was playing dwarves. They were moving five. Okay, right? okay. So I had a huge speed advantage, and we just ran up, punched the dude with the ball, popped it out, picked it up, ran it in. Now it's two to zero going into the half. Um, yeah. At that point, he started busting heads. Ooh. And my guy started to go down. So he learned quick? Now, you know, it, was, it wasn't even so much he learned. It's just that if if somebody's in a deficit in Blood Bowl, the play becomes just stomp out as many people as you can. And so he tried to stomp out as many people as he could. I tried to protect some guys. I had a bad strategy for my sort of like uh, injury prevent defense. Because I what you get in Blood Bowl sometimes is you have these turns where – the opponent cannot score in the amount of turns that are left because okay. they don't have the movement to run the ball in. Period. Full stop. Uh huh. So you get in these, you get these turns and these kickoffs where you have to play the turn, and so the whole game becomes protect your dudes, don't get them injured because if you if they get knocked out off the pitch, then you're down guys go, potentially going into the next half or into the next turn. You see. So the game went good. It did. Um, it got a little nip and tuck toward the end because he had three of my guys, one guy possibly dead, two guys knocked out. And uh, I did take an apothecary. So you can buy things with your salary cap with, like, your spare money. Cheerleaders, apothecary to <laughs> sort of get a free go again at an injury. So if a guy gets knocked out of the game entirely, you can burn your apothecary once a <laughs> game, and he's just stunned, which means he's – down, face down for a turn, then he flips, then you stand up and run him like normal. You should Google what the old school Blood Bowl orc cheerleaders look like. Oh, they're hilarious. <laughs> they're very dangly. Oh. Um, but it was it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. They, I thought they ran good. The thing is, I like to play Blood Bowl as if it's real football with my pass plays and my uh, end rounds and my okay. screens, right? And uh, it did that. And so I was like, this is great. You know, the uh, they looked good. They all had their bases done. I have not – you keep on telling me to put white field lines on the bases, and I don't know where to start with it, so I have Painter's not. tape and a sponge. Ooh, I don't know. 
I don't know. All right. So is that your bits box? Um, that's no. I've got one more thing. But what you, else you got? You you hit a thing. You've been painting these dark angels. Oh yeah, I've been painting how these are they, dark. How are they turning out? They're pretty good. It's all firstborn. Literally bought these things fifty bucks. You know, it was included a firstborn character. Where with are librarian. you getting a bunch of dark angels for fifty dollars? Um, it was just a, like a swap. I I told somebody who was a very big local Space Marine player. I was like, hey man, you got anything spare you don't want? He's like, yeah, I got a bunch of things, but I, and I'll give it to you all for fifty bucks. He gave me ten firstborn Space Marines. He gave me a Dreadnought, which is the old box knot, and then he gave me a Librarian character that was, like, I guess a special edition in 6th edition. And then I think a week later, they sent the box knot to Legends. <laughs> that uh, that Librarian's a resin guy, isn't he? Actually, he's uh, plastic. Oh, is he? Yeah. Yeah, he looked neat. In he's the, very uh, intricate. In the picture, you I'm glad I got it because you know my friend. Does he been, look tiny? He's very tiny. It's 25 mil. Oh wow. 25 millimeter base. Yeah, he's really, really intricate, and I like it. And I'm gonna. F- and, uh, last bit that I'm gonna say, uh, it's over my friend. He's been having a really rough go of it. He's had a lot of uh, uh, relationship problems, and then a lot of problems at home lately. So I'm trying to help. You know, help him out. I think that spending more time with him, and then potentially giving him a gift because I'm broke. I, I mean, can do very little to help out. Here you are making me feel like a duty head because I was accusing you of giving up the painting booty for free, and you were out here doing a really nice thing, and now yeah. I'm the bad guy. He's done a lot for my family. He's done a lot for me, and I figure, you know, if I can get him into this hobby that I love so much, maybe it will, you know, help therapize him a little bit, you know, being out, being social more, having some fun, learning a new hobby. Because we love this universe a lot, and I know a lot of people, this is like a big deal for them, and maybe it could help him out too, because he's he's in a really rough place, and I want to be there for him. Yeah, I mean, you know, who knows, right? The uh, the therapeutic side of it is real, because to continue my bits box, and we're just gonna have a long bits box. Oh, I'm because, closing my bits box. By oh, the way, that, you're closing your bits box. Closing. I was hoping you had something else in the box <laughs> because uh, I don't know what we're gonna about to do for this main topic. <laughs> on my 10th. Yeah, you know, talk about 10th. Everybody's hyped for it. However, I got more in the bits box. Okay, hit it. Man, this airbrush. This airbrush and these ghosty boys. So, I've been slowly but surely working on my Night Hunt army. So, here's what happened, right? Age of Sigmar is a thing. It's good. I haven't played a game yet. However... They had that uh, Night Hunt Legion of Grief or whatever it's called. Yeah, or maybe it's Legion of... Du- I don't know what it is. Or may- There's a box of Night Hunt that comes with a bunch of stuff. And they had it at the Gamer's Haven. Shout out times two. And I bought <laughs> it because I was like, shoot, I'd like to play, play Night Hunt. And I punched up what the points were in just the box. And the box itself is like 800, 900 points, right? Okay. So I'm like, man, I'm more than halfway there. And then there was a there was a couple characters that I wanted to have. And by the time I punched all those up in Battle Scribe, I'm like 1,500 points. Ooh. Next thing you know, I'm out of town a couple of times, and I've bought some other boxes of Night Hunt. And one thing led to another. I have like 2,400 points of Night Hunt. Unbuilt. Unpainted. Wow. On the sprue. New in box. Collecting dust, you, you a ha- pile of shame that amassed itself. You have fun with that. Oh, my gosh. Okay, so. Building is my favorite part of the game, by the way. That is just like, if I love painting, but building is my favorite oh, part. Oh, no, no. It's, so uh, send them it, to me. No, it's, uh, I don't know if you'd like building these guys. They are so, they are so pointy, flimsy, little. How are your fingernails doing? My my fingernails are they, they, they've got they've got a lot of plastic glue stuck to them. Um, I tell you, the worst is all their little heads. So if you haven't seen the Night Hunt, the majority of them like they're ghosts. So, but they they their little spectral form is like a wisp that attaches to the base, which is not a lot of surface area or oh, contact yeah. patch to put them on the base. Ooh. And then the wisp goes up, usually into a curve that you that is too tight to get your hand underneath. Uh, and then they're like three pieces that make up their body. And it's three pieces of like cloak that they have over their their ghostly skeletal form, right? Okay. So you glue these three pieces of cloak together. And all that is 
tricky because invariably, it's tricky. especially in a big box like I got where it's just sprue on sprue on sprue, uh, some of their little some of their little wispy bits are slightly bent, and so you go to put piece A oh. onto piece B, right? So so they're and warped. They're bent. Oh, so are they bent on purpose? No, they're just bent. They're bent because it's a big old heavy box full, oh. of, full of stuff, right? And so what Yikes. you end up with is you get like your big contact patches to go just fine, and then invariably toward the end of their wispy bits, you'll have to like put the glue on and bend it and then stick it and hold it, and it you know you never seem to hold long enough to get it to stick. I guess I could use super glue and activator, but I'm not I'm not that worried about it. These aren't even my problems. And I have one more point that on that, which is every single one of them, their head is a separate bit from the rest of their body. And Ooh. their heads are so tiny. Small, yeah. They're skeletal heads, most of them. They have their mouth open. They have, like, nothing inside their mouth. So right? you have to hold their heads on while you glue them. So you've got to, yeah. And what I need are, like, some neoprene-coated tweezers. Yeah. Somebody, somebody share an Amazon link with your boy That'd be cool. on the Twitter or something. Because what happens is you get your tweezers because you got to have the tweezers, right? The fingernails are not. But too much pressure and that thing's going to go flying. Flying, man. And then the cat's after it or it's trying to go down in a C vent. Or you don't even see it. Or it's just gone to the warp. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's right. ridiculous. They're so tiny. And none of that has been the problem. What's been the problem? Then? The problem is I don't know how to paint them, man. So I oh, had this idea on. that I had this idea that I wanted them all to be like purpley on their like their core, okay, and then that they would then sort of sort of blend to white, gray, you know, ethereal, ghostly, you know, phantasmic. You should gone with pink or something. Well, I I I've, I've ended maybe. up I've ended up with some various colors. The problem is. How do you make that transition? So I did, I did two units where I dry brushed like um, I dry brushed like a, an almost white gray color over the contrast paint purple. And they look acceptable. Okay. The problem is they look dusty because by the time you dry brush this thing to death like that. It looks kind of. It looks it, a little. You know. When spotty you, or fabric -y. It, lo it looks a little colored pencil. Uh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like when you see a really nice colored pencil drawing and it's like, this is so good. But it's not solid. But if it was if it was oil paint, it would yeah. be, you know, next level renaissance type stuff, right? Because there's sort of the limitations of the medium. Okay. So I got out the dry, I got out the airbrush. I bought a character the other day. The other day when we played, I bought. They had a. They I had, did see that character. They had a yeah. character. He's just yet another like ghost a with, a, or with a scythe, right? Um, and tomb uh, banshee, I think. Oh yeah, no, I bought the tomb banshee the day that I was playing with you. I bought this other guy. This very similar. He's a single model. He's on the teensy tiniest base. He's apparently some kind of character. I don't know what he does. I haven't even looked at the rules, but I needed like a test model for this airbrush scheme. So I get the airbrush out. I go to prime in white. I've, I'm, I'm on my second attempt of a white primer. This time I'm using the, uh, I believe it's AK, one-shot oh. primer. And it's white. And it, the previous primer, who knows what video I, or what pot I talked about this on, was uh, chunky like cottage cheese, so it wouldn't even spray. This new primer was Get the a couple other, beers in it. It's the other way. <laughs> it's so thin that... It just wouldn't cover. So I'm just that. spraying this thing to death. I could have dipped it, right? Oh, no. I Did mean, you let it dry? Yeah, well. Okay. Oh, well, no. Don't tell me you just kept spraying the it. The problem was, the problem oh. was I only had one model. I think this stuff would be fine if I do it, and I, this is the plan, is to do it like 10 or 20 models all at once. Okay. So that I can like Batch start on one, spray in this thing white, and then by the time I get to the end, I can go back to the start of the line. And then it'll be dry enough for like the second layer to really pile on. But I was right. frustrated. I was standing up. I'm I'm at the kitchen table. I've got my airbrush. It is not my airbrush was not clean enough from the previous attempt at spraying white. And it is just spitting and the stuff is thin. Oh, and no. the, and the, just the air is blowing everything that around. That sucks. So finally I got it white. <laughs> I then waited two days to, like, prepare myself for this debacle that I knew would be coming. 
I took the airbrush apart. I took parts out of this thing that I didn't know came out. I was like, you know what? You know. I'm done playing with this. If I break it, forget it. Oh, no. I'm taking it all the way apart. So I took it all the way apart, and I got it clean. And then I got me some Army Painter airbrush brand or type, right? Thinking maybe I won't have to thin this. Maybe it'll just spray. And it's this, uh, it's this blue color. Yeah. And I got it in there. And it sprayed. Did it work? Oh, okay. It sprayed. Well, you might want to be careful. There still could be a clog in there somewhere. That's what happened to me. It worked for a second and then it exploded. It, it was spraying. It sprayed fine. I got the blue all over my dude. I did me a little fade into white. And it looks good now? And it looks good. Good. And uh, I sent you a picture and... Uh, yeah. You know, oh, go, yeah. That was... That yeah. One? Yeah. Post that, post that thing on the uh, on the Twitter. It's done? It is, it is not done. It's not based, but it is Ooh. done. Um, so... I contrast painted his other bits after I had, like, the fade on. I was careful not to get paint where I didn't want it after I had his sort of, like, core intact, right, with the fade. And I think he turned out good. Now, he's so much cleaner looking than the dry brushed ones, but I think that's okay because, you know, they're all their own units. The other units will be their own units, but I think... I've gotten to a spot where I'm going to airbrush the rest of these models. Oh, yeah. He looks bad already. Yeah, he looks fine. And, you know, I'm going to base him just the same as the others. I think that he'll fit with the others, and it'll be fine. And, uh, you know, my idea, I bought a couple other colors of this uh, of these uh, Army Painter Air paints. I got like a, I got like a, like a yellow-green color, and I got, a, uh, I got a purple. Like a neon green? No, it's it's more is more like a sick like sickly looking green. Okay, but I think that'll look good as a subtle kind of thing, especially since a lot of these guys have like various shawls and cowls over their head and that drape across their shoulders. So those can be whatever solid colors because that's sort of like a solid part. But then their their ghostly wispy bits is really where the thing comes together. And yeah. That's my bits box. I'm, I'm glad that was a that was a fair bits box. I, I I feel your pain when it comes to the airbrush, though. It's it's rough. It's a struggle when they start to stop working and you don't know how to fix it, and then you're out like well, the I, cost of the airbrush. I feel like that I know how to fix it, which is just clean yeah. the thing. But you clean the thing, and it feels not like the thing's clean, yeah. and it's like, well, I'm not clean enough. So try again. It's like golly, and you don't know that it's not clean enough. <laughs> Okay. Until you get the paint in it, because yeah. it seems like the air, the like flow aid and all that kind of stuff, always Does, seems to it, spray just fine. Yeah. All right. So tenth edition, closing your bits box. Closing it. Closing it. All right. So let's get into this. Uh, we're talking about tenth edition today. They've been uh, releasing a lot of stuff this last week. A lot a- of stuff. Any hard opinion, Shane? Um. <laughs> this is this is my this is my own gripe. And it's like a public service announcement. Get that gripe water, son. Oh, my gosh. Some of y'all be getting so outraged. Dude, yeah. Um, I'm actually surprised not as many people that I've seen have been freaking out. But you tell me what you've been hearing because I am excited to hear. I mean, okay. The Death Watch came out. Uh, yeah, I've and, heard some griping. And they have already been FAQ'd or something. Like, they've already been fixed. Um, because there was something that was pretty objectively broken. Um, however, I've heard they're not as strong. Well, they're not as strong as they were the day they came out yes. because the day they came out, they were going to be real, real meme And the next day they released like, I believe the chaos stuff. And they were like, Oh yeah. And that death watch thing. Sorry. We were tripping. So it's been fixed. Now I do wonder which I don't even know if they're going to make Death Watch data cards, but we are we going to have to are we going to have to bust out the white out on some of these data cards before it's all said and done? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm some stuff has had some cool abilities, some stuff hasn't. I've seen like my personal favorite of some of the heroes, like Gabriel Seth, but then you've got other characters like Rabute Gilliman, you've got Dante the Blood Angels. All those guys get pretty good buffs, but then there's a couple you look at them and they're like, oh man, what happened to that? And it's like you got Cipher. I sent you a picture about him the other day. Uh, he was a pretty good auto include for a lot of chaos armies because you could use him as a CP farm, and he was pretty good at buffing characters. But now it just seems like he's kind of a low level buff, and he doubles the cost of CP. 
for a stratagem that already gets used. So if you've played 40K, um, you not a lot of rep- repeating the same oh, stratagems. Oh, no, 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 sir. Yeah? No, let, let, me, let me put you on game, Mr. Casey. So... Hit him, Game Master. Let's go. I've got to go find me a Cypher. One, because I think he's really cool. He's I, really I cool. like his whole lore and everything. Um, he's he, he, him, he himself is not that interesting. However, the word on the street is that in the new edition, you're going to only have like one or two CP at a time. That's true. And so if you go and somebody busts out their good stratagem, turn one or two, and you bump that sucker up to two... CP instead of one, or three CP instead of two. But my you point- have just shut down the game plan. Well, I get that, and that is cool. But now, are they going to really use the same stratagem twice? Unless it's something like Overwatch and all that stuff. But I don't think those are even stratagems anymore. Are they? Yes, they are. Okay, they are. So yeah, heroic on. intervention is one, and uh, Overwatch is one, I and guess um, yeah, and those are all the core stratagems. But then these these uh, six that we're getting with each faction. Some of those have got huge uh, synergies with abilities and keywords and and nearly every single one of them with your army rule at large, right? So that a lot of times these stratagems are going to be your your like you know they're going to be your falcon punch, right? And I mean, you could get it once. Yeah, and but you're not going to be able to afford to get it again. So I, change your plan, sir. Seems like a lot of uh, a lot of character abilities are centered around affecting CPs and stratagems, which I think is pretty good if they for what they've been what we've been hearing at least of rules and everything. Yeah, the um, a, a, a lot of your big sort of sort of warlord characters have got a lot of stuff where they can refund a CP or use a stratagem for free. Um, what I was noticing, so I'll just list a couple of my favorites from my army, the Chaos Space Marines, some, some matches. So my favorite thing about this army building, I can already tell, is going to be the attached units. It's going to be what 10th edition, I think, I think really runs on. I think that's going to be a game on. changer, yeah. Yeah, because... I already have a lot of characters. I mean, you see, taking Assassinate against your boy in Ninth Edition was always a viable strategy because I'm bringing dudes with names. Yeah, and I mean, I brought like five or six characters. Oh, I love characters. Uh, Hero Hammer for the win. Well, now when you're going to attach them, they only attach to the various things that they're allowed to attach to. So one that I just, that I'm really excited about that I think is really interesting is I just finished painting that Dark Commune. Go look at the Twitter for yeah, the pictures, pictures are of that. on the Twitter, guys. Check them out; yeah. they're really good. And uh, I got that dark commune done, and I think they're really cool. Now, in Ninth Edition, they were a they were a priest slash psyker unit slash you know combat unit, right? So you had psychic powers and prayers, and they have a little bit of pop in combat. In the new version, they're they're a psyker unit, but the main thing they do is they shepherd cultists. So they're allowed to lead a cursed cultist and cultist mob and maybe something else. I don't even have the data sheets in front of me. We've made no show prep today. But... Yeah, we're free winging it. That's why our bits box was so long. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you just got to filibuster in the bits box. Um, (laughs) But what's cool... So if the Dark Commune is leading cultists, they give the cultists an invulnerable save. So what? It, yes, yes. So that big old block of cultists that so is usually like just ten wh- very low point models that are just there to take shots and hold objectives. And are now- all of a sudden they're hard to get rid of. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and and once per battle, the dark commune can make those cultists advance and charge and get plus one to hit and plus one to wound. That's. That's really good. That's, that's really pretty, cool. That and, is really and good. And then, so I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I'm going to have somebody to go with my cultists. Then I go look at the cultists. The cultist mob. uh Sticky objectives on them boys. Oh, no. So, so now, not only are they extra killy and extra tough, now they hold objectives even if you kick them off. That's right. So you start your cultist mob with the dark commune attached in, in like, your deployment zone on top of your your home objective. Ta-da, it's held. They advance and charge into your orky boys in the middle of the table. They get plus one to hit, plus one to wound. Most of them die in the, in the hit back. Or maybe they don't because they've got an invuln save. True. And 
they're standing on the objective for when Abaddon and his Chaos Terminator squad that he's able that he's able to lead comes rolling through there, mopping you up, and now it's sticky. Gosh, that is just so oh, annoying. It's going to be that great. That sounds so annoying. <laughs> on the point of Abaddon, and I haven't seen if this is the case, but the way I read it, it is the case. When his data sheet was spoiled, he did not seem to be as meme as he had been previously, right? Where he had all the rules in the world. And a lot of people, like, got mad or anything. People like, got mad nobody because, got, because... But not as much as previously. People are silly. Look... I think I think I got lost before I finished my point earlier. <laughs> if we don't have the points, none of this matters. That's true. A lot Man, of people are freaking out. And people are like, "How am I going to anti tank enough?" Well, what if tanks are four hundred points apiece? Yeah, then we're all going to have a tank. Yeah, what like what if they take up half your army? Yeah, and then and you got two of them. You got to remember that points matter a lot during the these games. Points are the whole thing. And you know what? Maybe Games Workshop is going to mess it up. And the Drakari, you know, because they're going to be oh so overpowered, except we don't know the points. Maybe they're going to be cheap and and cheesy, and that'll be silly. Or maybe the maybe the Space Elves are going to be the Xenos equivalent of the Custodies. We don't know. We haven't seen any points. Anyway, I love well, that soapbox. What I'm excited about, Go obliterators. Uh, in my Chaos Army, I've got obliterators, and I love using them. But in 10th, they were kind of like, eh, they were a lot of points value. During ninth. Yeah, yes, during ninth, they were a lot of points for not enough stuff. You can include them in a unit of two and make them separate, or you could have them, you know. But either way, they were tough but their save wasn't that good. They didn't have an invuln save. They were really shooty and got shots across the board. But now, now, my boy, they have a five-up invuln save, which is okay. And they have an ability that lets them indirect fire. Yeah. Now, their ballistic skill is not great, is it? Uh, ballistic skill is actually a three-up, which is average. Yeah, so they're going go to so they're gonna go buff to a them four with something. on that. Like a tech, or like a, what is it, a, a tech, a warp smith. I have a warp smith. I can uh, t- buff them up with that, and I am looking forward to it. Yeah, you know, I don't like the Warp Smith as a model. I don't like his noodly arm bits. So really? I, Not I, even my Warp Smith? You don't like him? You know what? Your Warp Smith has a special place in my heart because I've killed him many times. <laughs> yeah. But, um, <laughs> but, yeah, the Warp Smith does not jimmy my jams. Um, does it jimmy in your jams? But, so, the thing that I've got for my army is this dark packed thing, and then I've also got these... Chaos keywords, right? So there's there's five of them because there's each there's all four chaos gods and there's chaos undivided. Now, Abaddon, back to him, where I think he's much more meme than people initially thought. He's got all five keywords, and the way the keywords work is oh, when yeah. you make a dark pack, packed. I read that you get either devastating wounds or sustained hits, and he can. And then uh, he's already got. Some, he's already got, you know, shenanigans on his data card. Yeah, so, I think if you so finish a dark gonna, pact. Well, he's going to kind of get all of them. Yeah. But then, if you have the keyword and you've done a dark pact, which everything in your army has to have, then you also get an additional thing, which most of them are crits on fives. Yes. Okay. So Which is devastating. Which, which means that Abaddon is going to be rolling out there, and he's going to be making dark packs. Which, at that point, I believe will trigger all five dark packs at once because he has all the things. And then his... He does have all the things. He's going to be doing mortals on fives and explodies on fives and lethals on fives. Can you do lethals and mortals? Like oh, It's devastating. He's, he's, it's going to be devastating. It's, yeah, he's going to make his boys shoot super hard. So all you guys who were running things like Obliterators, uh, Havocs, uh, what's the one? Reaper Chain Auto Cannons, uh, Terminators. Well, now guys. look, he can only lead uh, Terminator Squad, Legionnaires. Go to Legionnaire Squad. That, that may be it. Get as many legionnaires. Always go legionnaires because then you get more fire output that way. I don't know because then you go look at the dark apostle, who is a who is a. I mean, what, what's he? Uh, li- not a librarian. He's he's a psyker. Yeah. Oh, no, no, warp he, sorcerer. Well, he, no, he's the one that does the prayers in the command phase or did right. Yes. Well, he's super good with 
with the Legionnaires, and I forget what he does for them. He buffs but, them. Yeah, but he he buffs them and he gives them a lot of he gives them a lot of goodies. So my thinking is that the Dark Commune is going to go with the the cultist mob as a matter of course, yeah. and then Abaddon is going to go with the Terminator squad. Of course, Harkin World Claimer is up in the paint. He's going to go with the Raptors. I didn't look at his because I knew with. his was going to be amazing. Oh, he's going to be so cool. Um, something that I am interested. Do we know what Tenth Edition is doing with flyers? Um, um, there's a big old chunk of core rules for flyers. Okay, that, I gotta take uh, that a look I at that. Scanned, that I only scanned because I don't have any flyers. Man, I that I got that my, you, my Heldrake, my Heldrake looks a little pants. But hey, you've seen my Heldrake. Yes, it looks, I spent a lot of time on it. I it painted looks good. It really hard. Right around the time that I finished painting it, that's when Ninth Edition rules changed for flyers, and you couldn't bring a flyer in first turn. You had to put it on the board second turn, and this was. The whole game wide, not just chaos. This, so I had this really awesome unit that I barely used, and then once I put it in the game, I could barely find anywhere to put it because the board, either the, a the board was busy, or b um, the board was too short and was obstruct like like I said obstructed, or uh, b I had too many enemies on objectives. Yeah, I mean. I think, though, that's from playing a lot of... it's too late to save the game at that point. Yeah, but that's from playing a lot of thousand-point games. Like, but it was devastating because yeah. all these points going into one unit that I couldn't even use for a quarter of the game if I'm lucky. I would expect, in the case of the Helldrake, because that's... I mean, that was the only flyer data card we got, to my knowledge. Um, we'll I see think, a lot when I, orcs come out tomorrow. I, I think it's going to be cheap. I, I think I think the hell on the point of the Helldrake itself it'll be cheap. I, I, don't, I don't know about anybody else's flyers. I mean, the weapons are pretty decent on it. It's it's not like overpowered in my opinion. I think it's going to be like a force to be reckoned with. But um, I don't think that this is going to be a big like just from judging from what I've seen. I don't think flyers are going to be a big you know, overpowered force. I think they're going to be right in the middle. So maybe like what people used to take. In early ninth, and how devastating they were. Now it's a little different. So I don't think that the aircraft, because you know we're 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 saying flyers, like things of the fly keyword are different than aircraft, right? That's so true. We're talking about you got aircraft. raptors and stuff. I don't think aircraft benefit from cover, and so yes, the problem they don't. the problem that you get with aircraft is that they're just easy to draw a line of sight to. Yeah. So nothing can hide from them. They've got. They've got. They they require some movement unless you declare that they're hovering. In which case, then they can sit there. But um, and you remember the speed wall that I unleashed on on you the other day? Yeah. Well, if you think about it, what if orcs were running a mob of six, maybe ten, uh, def coptas, which have the keyword fly, which have ignored terrain, and also use the speed wall and have a very good ballistic skill or ballistics. And a very good melee. So imagine all of that, but extra shooty. So that's pro- I bet that's why they changed that rule. I don't doubt it. Yeah, and I don't believe you can fly over terrain anymore. Really? Yeah, I've, I've got to look at that about fly. But they, they've adjusted fly, and I've not seen it in practice to really get my head around the differences. Because the difference that's illustrated in the book is... If you want to land on something, then you have to measure the distance like diagonally. Okay. You know, a- accounting for the P- Pythagorean yeah. theorem of the increase in altitude, right? <laughs> I'm unsure if that means you can just that jump straight jams. over a, a a ruin, right? Yeah. Because if a ruin is like 14 inches tall and you've got, I mean, I guess flyers movement's unlimited yeah. in the case of... Most all that I've seen, you know, it's like minimum 20, but then unlimited movement. Then I guess you could, but I don't know. That's, well, and that's in the case of aircraft. So then I believe, like in the case of my Raptors, they can't just jump over whole chunks of terrain. But I'm going to have to look into it closer. I, I think that a lot of this kind of stuff that is often seen as nerfing a whole chunk of the game the 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 other side of the sword yeah. usually makes it so it's you know I'm betting they're just waiting. as viable. I'm betting that's why they waited to do points last. They're waiting to see what how the community reacts to all these stat lines for all of these weapons and vehicles and characters and troops. 
And they're like, okay, so now that people think this sucks, let's uh, lower the porn so they can take more stuff. You know, uh, I, that's what I would do. I I don't know. No. I hope that the points got figured out at around the same time as they made all those data cards. Like, I would hate to think that they're letting, uh, you know, Twitter upheaval guide the points cost of anything. Because, for instance, <laughs> people talking about Death Guard are no good and you're not going to be able to play Death Guard. Death Guard have, uh, rules came out yesterday. They've kind as of always recording, been good. And they, they have this... Um, they have this plague aura thing, and it in, and it right. grows. It I grows from like three six to nine inches, and this is around every single unit you've got. And that aura does mortal wounds, I believe, if you're standing in it. Yeah, when I heard about that, I thought that was pretty overpowered. And so it, I don't it, know what these people are talking about. It, Death well, guard being, and it, and it does like one mortal wound or whatever. But I'm just thinking, it's man, pre- it's pretty impressive. Auto damage is always good. I mean. Like especially with AP lowered, with toughness in, with toughness increased, anything that's automatically damaging anything is a huge boon for your army. Obviously, you know what Death Guard are balancing is they're just slow, but but everything's sticky. And after they leave an objective, the objective gets the aura of funk. Oh yeah, yeah. So now the objectives are hurting the. I enemy. thought that was pretty cool. Like that's really neat, man. It's very lore I, accurate, and I love it. I can't oh, wait to so take cheap all these battle shock tests, though. man, or to give out these battle shock tests. Man, a lot of uh, a lot of characters are getting that battle shock test. Everything is dealing um, out battle shock tests, man. That's what I think. The battle shock is what's going to move the battle around the table. I was reading uh, today the Imperial factions came out, and I read up on the uh, assassins. And a lot of their stuff, you know, affects stuff like that. The uh, sniper assassin, I forget his name, a Kalidus assassin, I think is it what it is. Anyways, it, this assassin has extremely good ballistics. Not as good as a space marine. He's sitting on threes. But they're devastating strength, pretty good AP, and the damage is uh, two or three. And in the middle of shooting, you have to take a battle shock test if you get hit. And I've, I've seen that with a couple of other characters. If you get shot by this character, you have to do a battle shock test, and it affects your leadership as well. I think that's pretty unique. Yeah, you know, there's... there's I want to see how that affects the game. There are quite a few abilities that I've seen where it's like each each unit that is, that is hit by this unit has to take a battle shock test. Has Gilliman's so, stats so, not dropped yet? Uh, no, he's in, he, he's he's in there. Are you it, sure? Yeah. I'm looking through the it's Space Marines. Two hundred pages of cards. On yeah, the I PDF. know. It's I'm flying through it, man. I'm just saying. Yeah. Um. But uh. Yeah. So you could like split fire if you could find somebody that like hits on twos, right? And you could just go on and target that guy and that guy and that guy and that guy and that guy, and just deal out however many battle shock tests right then and there, and that's that's going to be a problem for people, you know. Because you can just shut them down for a turn, which of course, in the in those cases, you've got to remember that is not your army going below half strength and failing to battle sh- or having to take a battle shock from then on. That's not the case. So they're going to recover on your next command phase and then be fine. But that could be a turn where they just, you know, a guy could get yeah. lucky and spike on the dice and shut down your scoring. Have some good old fashioned orc luck on you. Yeah, man. Yeah. It's going to be fascinating. Battleshock is so inter- integrated into some of these stats, and I really think it's going to be interesting to see how it sways a battle, especially one of those lower point games where things are really uh, swingy and it, like any decision could affect one person like swinging the game in their direction. I would love to see how Battleshock affects that. Well, I think the other thing that will be interesting is that we're going to have situations where because attaching characters are, is really fun, it is fun. If we're playing a thousand point game, we're going to want to bring a character for every unit. So we're only going to actually have like four units to make a thousand points, possibly. And it would be really easy for both armies to both be totally battle shocked and nobody can score. And then what? Yeah. Like, what, <laughs> what, what are you going to do? What, now, now we're going to play for the gambit? Yeah, maybe that's <laughs> the uh, maybe that's the fun because, you know. Oh, it's going to be wild. It, maybe that's for the people who are like, what? My arm, my, you won by points. What does that mean? You know, maybe it's something like that. And then you just like where 
let's fight and see who's still alive. Well, you know? or like I say, you remember the Gambit cards that are coming, right? Yeah, I'm excited for those. Uh, you talked about those a little bit. Yeah, where you get however many 30, 40 points if you make this Gambit, which it has some randomness to it. But I if, like if, that if so you're, much. If you've gotten yourself into a crazy attrition war where everybody's just mostly beat up, they're all battle shocked. They keep you just keep failing battle shocks, and then you have and, to come up with a and new you, strategy. And you can't use any strategies on these dudes because they're battle shocked. Yeah, and right? now you have to come up with a different way to play the game. You got to come up with something just so you can get points. It's so good. It's going to be so fun. And it I, is. And I like how nobody knows what's going to happen. I now, have my first game on Saturday. Who do? Ah, uh, me, my orcs versus. Leagues of Votan. Oh, you're playing uh, the homie Chris? All the punchiness and all the shootiness. Who's going to win? I mean, are you guys just bringing stuff, or are you just going to scramble once the points drop? And oh, Yeah, pretty much. Still, we're going to find out when the points drop, what we can take, and then we're going to make the best we can, go up there, reserve a spot at the table, and then we're going to see what we can do. You're going to muddle through. Pretty much. The last point that I want to make is we're coming up on time, you 40K fanatics. It's been, I, you know what? We didn't know what we were going to talk about. I feel like it's been a good podcast. It's been all right. A little, little right. bit of airbrush talk in there for our you know 10th what? edition talk. You look, know? <laughs> look, there is a danger that one day we become a painting podcast. Oh, you are right, if, sir. If Games Workshop has ruined Warhammer if, 40,000, the and game. You, and, you know, there's a lot of different paint companies out there. That makes solid stuff. I mean, you you like Ninjon. I think Ninjon has his own paint line, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's... uh, Oh, don't get me Lion, who actually makes it. Lionel Johnson. (laughs) Anyway, my last thing is uh, there's been a lot of abilities that grant damage reduction. That, That is true. However, there is no paragraph that I've read so far... In mass, I have seen some that are like two a minimum of one, but nobody in nobody in my army has got the two a minimum of one. So there's just a bunch of instances where damage reduction appears to allow for damage zero. Ooh. So there are units with abilities that you can't you can't hurt with damage one weapons. And that is gonna be bananas. It is um, something that I've noticed. There's not a lot of fight and charge effects. There's a lot of shooting, a lot of psychic. But have you noticed any stats or anything towards fighting that get affected? I'm trying to think. Um, and I don't mean like plus one to hit or anything. I mean like anything like specifically like fight twice or maybe like extra attacks. I haven't seen too much of that. Yeah, you know, now that you mention it. It doesn't feel like there's a lot of. That. I just literally thought of that. The, there does seem to be quite a bit of shooty shooty. Well, no, a, a bunch of like, if your if your thing went off and you're fighting, then you get or th- there's a lot of stuff like stratagems. If, if your dark pack happened to uh, this unit, then they get plus one to charge. They a get lot to re-roll of abilities charge, which right? affect stratagems, which affect abilities. Well, stuff no, like that. A, a lot of army rule that affects ability. There you go. There you go. So yeah. like. Because in in my army, you it's optional to take the dark pack. You you end up having to take a leadership test, which is the same as a battle shock test, but not because you if you fail, you're not battle shocked. Instead, yeah. you take D three mortal wounds, Oof. which is not insignificant. I did see that. Yeah, but there's a whole bunch of abilities that are like if you're if you got your, if you did a dark pack, then you get reroll charges, for instance, you know, or you know that kind of stuff. But yeah, the. It makes for an interesting thing because there's a lot of... I have seen quite a bit of, like, this unit is eligible to fall back and charge or fall back and shoot, which fall back and shoot, I guess, makes more sense. But it's like, in ninth edition, the whole reason you wanted to fall back and charge was to re-up your buffs for that charge turn combat. And get the five first, too. Yeah. And so... Ooh, have you heard about this Eldar stuff that's been going around? I don't think so. I you, mean, I you mean, haven't like, heard about like the, the other broken stuff? skeins of fate dice. Stuff. I have no idea what, exactly what it is, but people are saying that tournaments are already banning okay. Eldar players okay. from being able to play a tournament. But stats haven't even dropped for them, right, have they? Right, a tournament banned the Eldar at the moment they saw the army rules, and then I think they've backtracked on it because they were like, "Man, what are we doing?" And furthermore. What are they doing having a tournament like the, the, the day the edition that it comes isn't out. even out? The day it comes out, don't like, do that. Like, you're gonna 
I mean, I get you're trying to have fun. Brokenness is not going to be their biggest problem. Their their biggest problem is going to be a whole lot of people not knowing the rules. Yeah, don't charge people money to beta test the game in a tournament well, when it, it just came out the day before. Well, and it wasn't a GW tournament. It was just some tournament. Oh, but, yeah. You know, the, the internet. It was just some guy. Yeah, the internet doing internet stuff where it's like, ah, oh, such and such is banned because of whatever. It's like, who are you? True. Who who are you, Reddit person? Where is this tournament? Is it even a thing? You know, don't believe anything we say, and certainly don't believe anything you read on the internet, and only believe half of what you see <laughs> on the internet because that's the only place that things can be seen, and most of it is deep faked. True or, or something. Fake news. And fake news. Uh, while we're Sad. doing this, this is uh, Wednesday the fourteenth, and tenth edition finishes either on Friday or Saturday. Um, I cannot wait to get some points. I cannot wait to get my data cards tomorrow. Yeah, you're gonna be hype. You're gonna be sending me all kinds of stuff so that I'm only gonna glance at. Psyched, and I'm prob- I'm gonna screenshot so much stuff and blow up your phone. Man, me and Casey have uh, we have a policy that we don't talk about anything until podcast time, so that we can fill this hour for you guys. Yeah, fill the hour, fill the bits box. You know, whatever we can do to just keep our butts talking. Our <laughs> possible real and meaningful friendship is ever sacrificed like the thousands of psychers at, on the golden throne for oh, your entertainment the game master's dropping lore look at that <laughs> that's growth that is growth like lionel growth. putting his putting the band back together yes it, he is the uh, man when we talk about him or whatever we have to talk about next you you won't believe how much he's changed it's it's ridiculous i've been shane that's casey you guys and we have been the 40k fanatics <laughs> and the friends we've made along the way here in the Grimdark Garage. See you guys.